Hello and welcome to my channel. When is the last time you told someone about Jesus? Do you ever stop and think about the power of your testimony? Can you share with someone how Jesus has made your life different? Well, we have an opportunity every day in the great world around us, and we're going to talk about it in today's video. Let's go. Sunday, 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 this is our international lesson study for Sunday, February 7th. My name is Waynell Henson. Many of you know me as that Sunday school girl. And since 2015, I've been in this space changing the way that people see Sunday school. You know that it makes my heart so glad that you choose this community week after week as your place for study and great resources. So thank you again for choosing this space and thank you for allowing me to serve you. I am so excited about this series of lessons that we are into as we wrap up this quarter study on the call of God in the New Testament. We are focusing on women and you know from last week that I just get giddy about women's studies. But before we get into to all of my excitement, let me slow down and say hello to some very special people. And those are the folks who are new around here. If that's you, allow me to say welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I am glad that you're here. I promise this. You are going to be blessed. There are people just like you here who love God, love his word. We are growing and getting better. And you know what? I am just in complete awe that in just a few days, we are going to hit 35,000 subscribers on this channel. So welcome to this family. Listen, look down below, click the subscribe button so that you get connected, but also look for the bell. Click the bell. You need that so that you don't miss any content when it's uploaded on this channel. You'll get your notifications. We're currently uploading at least three videos a week. We start together on Mondays for Markup Monday. I go live here on YouTube at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. This past week, there were more than 370 people who joined live as we preview this week's lesson. We read and we make an observation of the text. I share with you a free template that you're able to download and create your own personalized study plan. And then you either come back here for this lesson review video, or if you're not back in your traditional worship setting and you want to join live on Sundays, we do virtual Sunday school at 9.45 a.m. Central Standard Time. Last week, still more than 200 in virtual Sunday school, so we'd love to have you. We also do a video for the young people that sort of puts the uh, lesson in conversation language that they understand and then again there are all kinds of other resources zoom powerpoints and downloads for the kids and listen it's sunday school central here and i am glad that you have connected with us so before we get into the lesson y'all know i've been asking for your help for the past few weeks and yes i've been taking a little bit of personal privilege because as i serve you i also have some things playing in my personal background and i don't often bring personal things into this ministry space but this time i need my community i serve you and now i'm asking for you to help me I am a candidate for the Board of Trustees for the Church of God in Christ. And listen, y'all are my team. So I need your help. Whether you are Kojic or not, I need your help sharing my information on social media. If you have influence with people who are voting delegates in the Church of God in Christ, would you say something nice about me? But listen, tell them this. My legal name is not that Sunday school girl. When they mark their ballots on February 23rd, it will say Waynell Henson. So I need your help. I need your prayers more than anything. This is probably the biggest thing I've ever um, offered myself for in our national church. And I do believe God to honor this space for me and my willingness to serve. So more than anything, I just need y'all to support me, pray for me. If you'd like to see how you can help donate to my campaign, I'll put it down below. It says stick with Waynell and I'll mail you out my gift for hanging in here with me. So thank you all so, so much. Don't forget that the replay from boot camp is still available. And I'm trying to think, oh, for the month of February, this coming Tuesday, 
um, where's my calendar here? February the 9th. I have been offering a lot of Tech Tuesdays. I think I did one every week in January. I'm going to go to an every other week planned schedule. Um, but on Tuesday the 9th, I am doing a private event for a group that already has more than 100 people in it. So that session is full. But listen, meet me on February the 16th. February the 16th, the planned session for then is called Teach Me TikTok. There will be a sign up for it. There will be limited space in that. But if you have been wanting to learn TikTok, if you're trying to brush up on your technology and things that you can engage in Sunday school, make sure that you watch for that link when it down, when it's dropped. You want to make sure that you're signed up for all emails as well because I usually drop information to the email database first. All right, listen, that's all I have for now. If you want the TSSG notes as we get into the lesson, they're always the first link in the description box down below. Make sure that you got your commentaries, your Bibles, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks because it's time for us to get into this lesson. Our lesson title is Call to Evangelize or Call to Testify. The Bible basis is St. John chapter 4, verses 25 through 42. The Bible truth. After meeting Jesus, the Samaritan woman becomes an evangelist. Our memory verse is verse 39. And the lesson aim is that we will analyze the barriers that Jesus crossed in speaking with the Samaritan woman. Since the wonder the Samaritan woman felt in her meeting with Jesus, and share with others the transforming power of God at work in our lives. Of course we're going to have story time. There is no way that I can talk about a lesson on testifying and not go back to my childhood. Now, most of you all know that I am born and reared in a small family church. And every Sunday, we had testimony service, you know, First, giving honor to God, to the pastor, saints, and friends. Truly, I thank the Lord for being here on today. I thank the Lord for being saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost and that with the mighty burning fire and whatever you were going to say in the middle and end it with and pray for me that I might be one of the ones that the Lord is calling for in these last and evil days. See, some of you recited that along with me because you grew up with testimony service as well. And in my church, our pastor, my grandfather, insisted that every individual from the oldest to the youngest, if you could speak, he insisted on hearing your voice and he knew whose voice he hadn't heard. So he may say, well, I haven't heard from Sister Waynell today because it was important for him that we learned to lift up our voices and to say something good about and good to our God. This is what we're seeing in our lesson this week as we're looking at the call to evangelize or the call to testify. You and I are called to use our voices for God. We are in St. John chapter 4 and John is one of the disciples. He's the beloved. He loved Jesus. Jesus loved him. Had an amazing relationship and really got to see firsthand the movement, the relationships, the works, the saving power of Jesus Christ. John chapter 4 is pretty interesting. We are seeing in this particular chapter a lot of diversity. There's a significant presence of the Samaritans who historically didn't have any dealings with the Jews. We also see diversity in gender with male and female roles. So we see racial differences. We see gender differences, differences in faith. And we also see a very powerful um, use of women in building the kingdom. Women believed on Jesus and they didn't just believe, but they became disciples and the mouthpieces, the carriers of the message of faith, the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. In chapter four, this is the story of the woman at the well. Our scripture reading begins at verse 25. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is also called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Let's talk about our cast of characters. In our immediate view, we have Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We will ultimately see the disciples and other Samaritans. But for now, let's figure out how Jesus even got into this conversation because he's talking to a woman and the woman is a Samaritan. We've already established that the Samaritans and the Jews had little to no dealings with each other. So how did this moment happen? Well, if we read earlier in chapter four, look at verse three, that Jesus is headed from Judea into Galilee. 
And instead of taking the most direct route, he felt the need to go through Samaria, verse 4. He was moved to go that route, even though it was not the shortest or the most direct way. Jesus knew that there were people who needed him as well in Samaria. So here in this moment in verse 25, there are two very different people. There is a thirsty Messiah and a woman with a water pot. We know that Jesus has been traveling and he comes upon Jacob's well. That's in verse six. And he was tired from his journey. It was about noon. And there he finds a woman who is drawing water in her water pots. Now this is different. It's kind of weird because they would have normally drawn water earlier in the day before the sun was too high. And so Jesus approaches the woman and says, he needed something to drink. Jesus exposes his own uh, humanity and his vulnerability. He was thirsty and he said, give me to drink. And his disciples were not with him. That's important. Note that in verse eight, his disciples are not there. They've gone into the city to buy meat. And here is this woman who knows that it's strange for a Jew to be asking her for water. And she says, you know, we don't have anything to do with each other. You know, we're, we're different races. We're different people. And Jesus answered her and let her know that if you knew the kind of gift that was standing in front of you, you would have not only given me something to drink, but you would have asked me about living water. And he begins this whole metaphor on living water. Well, the woman sort of spars back and forth with Jesus a bit. And she talks about drawing water and the mountains that they've worshiped on. And Jesus explains to her that if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. She also, again, talks about where they've worshiped. And Jesus explains to her that it was not about the where, but he's starting to talk to her about a different way of understanding her faith and knowing that worship was not about a specific location, but about the heart and the intent. So he explained that those who worship had to worship in spirit and in truth. He goes on to ask her, uh, he says, go call your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You've had five husbands and the one that you're with now, y'all live together, but that's not your husband. And so she knows in that moment that she is in the presence of someone who is different. She says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And Jesus again tells her that this is the hour when those who worship him are going to worship him in spirit and in truth, because this is what the father is seeking. She is having a moment and encounter with Jesus. And she's still kind of in verse 25. She's not quite sure of the fullness of who he is. In fact, she says, there's a Messiah coming. And when he comes, he's going to straighten all this out. And Jesus lets this woman know that I am the Messiah and I am standing right in front of you. Let me slow down just a bit because there is a lot even in that background portion. Again, this woman who is drawing water has a surprise request from a thirsty Messiah. He's exposed his own need and she's hesitant to comply. This woman, let's talk about the Samaritan woman. And in my notes, I actually made a chart because these people couldn't be any more different. The woman here is unnamed. Uh, she wasn't even important enough to get a name in scripture. We just know that she's a Samaritan. That's a strike against her. She's a woman. That's a strike against her. She's out with her own water pot. And that, on the one hand, is kind of a winning quality because Jesus actually has a need. He's not a local. He doesn't have a water pot. So the guy who seems to have everything, at least from a gender and a racial perspective, still is coming up short as it relates to getting water out of the well. So she has something that can help him. She has the water to draw out of the well. Let's talk about Jesus for just a second. Jesus, again, seems to have an advantage. He's a male. He's a Jew, but again, he's traveling through this area and he does not have the water pot. And therefore, on some level, each of them has something that is valuable to the other person. I really thought about that in the respect of diversity. And sometimes we look on others and what they have may not match what we are or what we appreciate. And yet there is something that that other person may have that could be a benefit to us. Let's talk about more strikes against the woman. 
She's been married a few times, not just a few. She's had five husbands. Now, I do want to pause here because there are lots of commentaries that uh, would suggest that this was a woman of ill repute, but I cannot find anything in the text to support that. There are a number of reasons that she may have been married multiple times, and we don't get that information from the text. But we also see that she doesn't jump at every man. If you look at how she responded to Jesus, she kind of pushed him back. She re she kind of stepped back and said, hey, you know, we don't have dealings with each other. So it's kind of, um, it's difficult for me to argue that she just jumped at every man that she saw. But I also noted that this is no dumb woman. She is able to hold her own in conversation with Jesus. And look at this, like she boldly and she proudly stands on behalf of her people. She uses pronouns like our and we. She actually challenges Jesus' authority just a bit versus the ancestors and the way that they've always experienced their faith. But I also saw this as a wow. She's a Samaritan, but she had expectation of the Messiah. That is pretty interesting that someone who wasn't even supposed to believe had that level of expectation and that level of faith. Let's talk about Jesus again for a moment. Jesus actually shows respect. Why do I feel that way? Well, because he entertains the conversation with her. He has the full conversation, even when she challenged him, even when she had questions, he dignified her with a response. And back to the idea of her having many husbands, I also note that it's interesting that even in that conversation, Jesus does not rebuke her or even indicate that she is a sinner. I'm going back to the woman for a second. She's a thinker. She knows how to raise great questions. And she is literally sparking this conversation on worship and really the thoughtfulness of how worship is done and where worship was. And she initially is very literal in her interpretation until Jesus reveals himself. But again, Jesus is trying to get her through his metaphor of living water and explaining that worship must be in spirit and in truth is explaining to her not where to worship, but how worship must be done. He wanted her to understand that. In all of this, what actually happens? She has an encounter with Jesus. It is impossible to run into Jesus and have that kind of exchange and not be affected and not leave in a way that was different. And she says, again, she's confident. I know that Messiah is coming. And Jesus continues this conversation with her. And the woman in that moment, when he reveals himself, she immediately has this moment. She has come face to face with the Messiah, the one that she's been anticipating, the Christ that she talked about. This was interesting for me. This is the first time in John, this is the first time that Jesus reveals himself to a human and he reveals himself in the I am form to a woman, an unnamed woman from an unlikely place with a background that was not expected. He reveals himself to her first. In verse 27, those disciples that I told you about from verse 8 that had gone into the city to get me, they come back and all they see is Jesus talking to the woman who is a Samaritan woman. And the disciples see this conversation and they are troubled by what they see. Uh, they are surprised by what they see. Why are they surprised? Again, because it's a woman, she's a Samaritan, and I can just about assure you, even if I can't call her a woman of ill repute, I think everybody probably knew that she had lots of husbands, and so it was her, it was that woman, and they were again surprised because a Jew would not have had that kind of dealing. Jews sort of saw themselves as an exclusive community, but Jesus was not like that. In fact, we saw in last week's lesson that Jesus is for everyone and he embraced all kinds. But I noticed this as well in verse 27. Nobody asked Jesus questions. They had questions in their minds about what was going on, but none of them opened their mouths to challenge Jesus on that at all. In verses 28 through 29, we see the results of this encounter that this woman has had. In this moment again, her life 
has been impacted and it has been changed forever. And the change with her encounter with Jesus was immediate. It was so quick that she went running back to tell others about what had happened in her life. She left so quickly that she leaves behind the water pot, the thing of value, the thing that she took out there to draw the water. She left it behind to go into the city, into Samaria to tell others what Jesus had done. And when she goes, there was an excitement in her. Do you remember your first encounter with Jesus? What was that like? What was your excitement and who did you tell about it? This woman goes into the city and she begins to use her voice and she extends an invitation. And she says, y'all come, come see a man. Come see a man who told me all about me. She invites people to come and not have her experience, but come here and have an experience of your own. This was interesting because she goes with such excitement, not knowing whether her invitation would be accepted or refused. But her excitement about Jesus and the change that he made in her life compelled her to go and to draw others. This turned her into an instant evangelist. This moment was big. It was essentially the start of revival in her area. She, for whatever else anyone else thought about her, whatever else had happened in her past, God used her in that moment and her influence made a difference. And at her word, the lesson tells us, others came to hear what it is Jesus had to say. We don't know what she said, but we know that she shares in a way that is so strong that it compels others to come based on her experience. That tells me that you don't have to have a certain set of words. You don't have to have the most buttoned up or polished testimony. All you need is the ability to lift up your voice and to tell the world, to tell an individual, to tell a friend, to tell a coworker, to tell a family what family member what Jesus has done for you. In verses 31 through 33, the disciples had been into the city to get food and so they want Jesus to eat. They're trying to convince him, but Jesus says, "I have meat that you don't even know about." And the disciples are taking that literally trying to figure out, "Well, now which one of you already brought Jesus some food?" but they just didn't get it. Very rarely did they click in and understand that Jesus was giving them a lesson. There was a spiritual application to what he was explaining. In verse 34, he says that my meat, the thing that fulfills me, the thing that makes me feel substantive or gives me purpose is to do the work that I was sent to do and to finish that work. And then he transitions the metaphor and he begins to speak in terms that are more about farming or agriculture, things that they would understand. They would understand this idea of planting. And when you plant, you know that my mother always has a garden. And when you plant seeds in a couple of maybe weeks, maybe a few days, you start to see a sprout up out of the ground and it's just above and you're looking at it and you see growth happening, but in your mind, it's not time to go and pull up those things just yet. So you look at it and see pr productivity, but you're not willing to go in. Jesus says, I need you to get in a bigger hurry than that. Look on the field and don't say I need to wait a few more weeks or wait a few more months or whatever that is. When you see that little bit coming up, when you see that moment that you can go in and begin to share with someone, as soon as you see that opportunity, recognize then that there is a harvest that is in front of you. And as they were even transitioning in this story, remember there's been a woman who has gone ahead and she's already laid evangelistic foundational work. She's already begun to speak in the city. So their interest was peaked. They were like those little seedlings that were starting to come up. And Jesus is explaining, we don't have four months. We don't have that kind of time. We need to go in now because there is so much here that needed to be harvested. We have souls right here in our hands. He says that the fields are white, all ready to harvest. So again, Jesus is helping the somewhat misguided understanding of the disciples. They've been focused on the wrong things. They don't want to, he doesn't want them to be focused on bias 
or what they don't have in common with the Samaritans or the distance that society said should keep them apart. Jesus wanted them to be mindful of the soul opportunity, the S-O-U-L opportunity that was before them. And there were plenty of souls. He goes on to talk about reaping wages and going in and having the opportunity to reap harvest, to gather the harvest that was present and gathering that harvest so that they would be able to experience eternal life. And it wasn't just about those who sow and those who reap, but because everybody's going to rejoice together. So now what does that mean practically? It means that you and I, as we share our testimonies, there will be some people who are not going to grab a hold of what we say immediately, but your story may make a difference and I may come along and say something that makes a difference. And ultimately there will be a person who may win that individual to Christ, but we will all, I'm a sower, you're a sower, the other person reaps the harvest, but we all rejoice together. Why? Because the soul has come in. The soul was a part of the gathered harvest. And we rejoice when others come into the space of receiving eternal life. And that's what Jesus wants them to understand. He even goes on to say that there will be people who sow and there will be people who reap, but we should never underestimate the moment and our opportunity. He even goes on to talk about reaping where you didn't even you didn't even do the hard work. So as we go back and look at this woman, we know that these disciples in Jesus, they go into Samaria and there is a harvest of souls, but again, the woman came in and did the groundwork with her testimony, the power of your testimony. It may not be the conversion moment, but it may lay the groundwork and someone else may come in and they may reap behind what you planted. But God, after all, gets the glory in all soul winning. So you and I again, we have to think about how we use our experiences, how we use our testimony. What is it that God has done? What can we share with someone else? And how will God be glorified in it? In verse 39, many of the Samaritans that were in the city, here it comes. They believed on him and they believed because of the saying of the woman at the word of her testimony. Many people came to know Christ. Who is waiting to know Christ based on what you are going to share? It was because of her testimony. Verse 39 tells us that she told them everything that he had done. I always talk about the results of ministry and here are the results of ministry based on this testimony. There were souls brought into the kingdom in verses 40 and 41. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him. They wanted him to stay for a few more days. And so Jesus stays two more days. And while he's there, I love this in verse 41, many more believed because of his own word. So there we have it again. There was the work of the woman, but then there were others who believed, maybe not because the woman came through, but now here is Jesus and he reaps the harvest. And again, there's the rejoicing together for the many that came into the kingdom, the results of ministry. Finally, we have in verse 42, and said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, but because we've heard him for ourselves. And we know indeed that he is the Christ, the savior of the world. Again, this woman's evangelistic ministry could not be denied, but there were still people who valued it more because they heard directly from Jesus himself. And you know what? That just, that didn't mean that her testimony wasn't effective, but that just shows the effectiveness of the work when it is personal in you, when Jesus himself did the work and it made the difference in their lives. But here's what I love. They recognize that this indeed, without question, that's what indeed means, without question, no one was, no one had doubt anymore that this was indeed the Christ. And I love this term. He was called for the first time, the savior of the world. The first time he is called the savior of the world, again, indicating that he's not just for one group, but for the entire world. And he's recognized by who? An unlikely group, a group from a different racial background, a group that had a different religious background, but they came to know and came to use their own voices to call him the savior of the world. That's our lesson for this week. I have a ton of key learnings in here. Let me share them with you. 
The first is where we just ended is that Jesus is not just for you. Your experience, what God brought you out of, what he delivered you from, is not just for you. You, your testimony, his work in your life, it is for everyone. And God brings us out to send us back in. We saw that last week. He brings us, he does the sanctifying work in us, he cleans us, and then he sends us back out. Because he, the work that he does is for everyone. And we become these living examples to the world of the power of Jesus Christ. Next, evangelist, evangelist. That is not a title reserved for a special group of people. We are all called to evangelize. So you are an evangelist and you and you and I, we are all evangelists and we are the billboard that the world needs to see. The billboard is our testimony. So again, we are his witnesses and we should never underestimate the power of our testimony. We should talk about our experiences and talk about our faith. It is a trick of the enemy to make us so ashamed of things in our past that we don't use those stories of deliverance and victory to show other people, to show a dying world that you can be delivered to. Sometimes inside of our differences, um, our capabilities or abilities in the other person that the one may need. So again, Jesus seemed to have had the advantage. He was a Jew and he was a male, but he didn't have a water pot. And the woman had a water pot, but she didn't have salvation. So everyone has something that you can share even when we are different. So never allow our differences to be that thing that keeps us from coming together for the purposes of the kingdom of God. We are called to use our voices to influence and offer Christ to others. And we have to watch behaviors that make us gatekeepers or cause others to feel unwelcome in the company of Jesus. And that's exactly what the disciples did. Although they never articulated it, sometimes we've got to watch our attitudes that somehow tell people that you don't have access to Jesus or you don't deserve to be in this space. We've got to watch that. God's work in our lives empowers us to be witnesses. So I challenge you this week, and especially this weekend, to think about how you use your voice, how you can encourage someone through your testimony. Finally, there is strength when we overcome our personal biases and our personal prejudices in order to allow others um, into the spaces that we need and certainly to get others to Jesus. And we need to get rid of all that, those things that keep us from being together and just, just doing what God wants us to do because we've got to be about the kingdom of God. So again, I encourage you this week to think about the power of your testimony. How will you encourage someone? How will you let them know about the saving power of God in your life? This is our lesson. Oh, I didn't invite you to please thumbs up like this video. Come on. Come on, we'll just take you a second, click thumbs up like. Don't forget to leave a comment down below if there's something in your notes that you want me to add to my notes. And y'all know how this works. I take your stuff and then on Sunday I have like really bomb notes. I love you all so much. I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye everybody. This bag makes a great gift for teachers and of course there's a church school version as well. Visit my Etsy store for this and other great items. And look down below this video for t-shirts for all ages and sizes. Sunday school with that Sunday